can not come in. Why? This is only for girls. Welcome to the Talk Femme Podcast, dedicated to discussing women's issues from a non-bipartisan standpoint. You need to start giving her promises. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. We had to take the week off last week, but we're back. And for this show, I am going to be playing some clips and giving my commentary as well as updating you guys on where abortion access is at right now in this wonderful country and how we are literally going back to the dark ages and how Republicans are using this as a political move. Um, So first of all, we have Trump obviously taking credit for ending Roe. Um, But now he wants to play both sides and be like, oh, well, you know, I just think it should be up to the states. Uh, And yeah, that's not working out very well for us. So recently in Arizona, um, they have started enforcing an 1864 ban. Now, I'm going to be reading from Jessica Valenti's newsletter. Um, It's called... What is it called? I think it's like abortion today or something. I'm sorry. I I can't find the title right now. Um, But it's a free newsletter. You can upgrade to a paid version where I believe there's more information. Um, As far as I've been able to see, Jessica seems to have the most comprehensive coverage on abortion access in this country. So I want to read from her newsletter here. Um, The state Supreme Court ruled in favor of a total abortion ban in Arizona. All right. So, I was really, really hoping it wouldn't go down this way. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled today that a 160-year-old total abortion ban is enforceable. Justice John R. Lopez the Fourth. Or is that, I, I forget Roman numerals, <laughs> whatever, wrote in the ruling, in light of this opinion, physicians are now on notice that all abortions, except those necessary to save a woman's life, are illegal. Okay, do you know how hard it is to get exceptions? And do you know how much pressure these providers are under and how they might even still withhold life-saving medical care if, even if it is um, necessary to save the woman's life. We're already seeing that happen because these these providers are afraid of going to jail, right? Like, I, I really can understand where they're coming from. The law will go into effect in 45 days. That means you can still access abortion in Arizona up to 15 weeks until that date. Okay, Governor Katie Hobbs responded to the ruling by calling it a dark day for Arizona. Arizona's Democratic Attorney General Chris Mays called the decision an unconscionable and affront and an affront to freedom and said that she would not prosecute any doctors or women under the ban. Today's decision to reimpose a law from a time when Arizona wasn't a state, the Civil War was raging and women couldn't women couldn't even vote, will go down in history as a stain on our state. You may remember that last year, Governor Hobbs granted Mays with the authority to prosecute abortion cases, taking the ability away from the district attorney. It was essentially a way to ensure that no one was prosecuted for abortion crimes. When furious Republicans called on Governor Hobbs to rescind the order, she refused, saying, I will continue to use my legal authority to protect Arizonans from extremists who want to prosecute women and doctors for their health care decisions. Now that the total abortion ban will go into effect, however, that order and May's ability to handle all abortion cases may be challenged by a local prosecutor. So I'll be curious to see what happens when the ban is enacted. Will doctors adhere to the law or will they keep providing care knowing that AG has promised to protect them legally? The ruling in Arizona also mirrors what's happening in Florida. Yay. The freedom state, right, guys? We're just so free here. You can't get life-saving abortion care, but you can carry a gun without a license now. I love how they made me um, they made me pay for and renew my concealed weapons license like a week before um, the they got rid of the licenses. I was like, thanks. Thank you, Florida, for hitting me up for money for literally nothing. <laughs> whatever. Um, Okay. So Florida, where a state Supreme Court decision allowing a six week ban. Okay. You guys, you guys, I don't think a lot of people understand, especially men, if you're listening, you know, and thank you for listening if you are, because you genuinely actually seem to care. So you're a rare gem 
thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> a lot of women don't even realize they're pregnant until the, around the six week mark. Me personally, I, sometimes I get my period every four weeks. Sometimes it's a week, you know, quote unquote late. It really has to do with the stress in my life, what I'm going through. Um, so by the time you realize you're pregnant, I believe you're already like four weeks into it. So six weeks. Okay. A lot of women might not even test until around this time, especially imagine children. Okay. Children aren't going to be like, gee, my, I missed my period because at that age, young girls are not having regular periods. They might come every six months, three months, you know, like it's not a regular thing for a lot of young girls. So they're not going to realize this. And, and a lot of people in their lives aren't going to realize this little girl's pregnant until she starts showing. Okay. So six weeks, oh, what a joke. They, they might as well just ban it outright because that's pretty much what's going on. Okay. Um, and that's why they want all this information on when your last menstrual period was. So they can be like, oh, sorry, you listed here on the Flow app, which we have access to, by the way, um, that your last period was at this time. So that means that you're seven weeks pregnant. Sorry. Sorry. And, you know, this has already – I've already seen it in my personal life. I used to work um, at a location, and there was a 14-year-old girl there who I know – like, I know this girl. I've talked to her. I've been in her presence, okay? She's someone I know for my life. She's 14. She just got pregnant and cannot get an abortion. She's 14. 14. And her friends are concerned that she might take her own life because of this. Now, obviously, I told them you need to tell somebody about this. You know, you need to alert the parents. I'm sure the parents already know that this is something that the young lady is grappling with. But we're, I think we're going to see a lot of this, unfortunately. We're going to see women, young girls, taking their own lives because they are, they are not ready to be mothers, okay? Maybe they never will be, and that's okay. Not every single woman is meant to be a mother, and forcing women into motherhood is sick, and it's only going to degrade the quality of our society because... Motherhood is hard, okay? It's not easy. This country does not do anything to help us. This country hates us. <laughs> we don't even get maternity leave unless you have a salaried position, which is extremely hard to find. Even me personally, I have a master's degree. I have other credentials, and I can barely find a salaried job because these companies don't want to pay for your benefits. So they'll say, oh, you can work 30 hours, and you can be a 1099 independent contractor, and we don't have to provide you with health insurance, dental insurance, nothing. You just work for us, and that's it. So um, Arizona for Abortion Access, a coalition of reproductive rights groups, says they've collected enough signatures to get their measure on the ballot. They've gathered more than 500,000 signatures, over 120,000 more signatures than they needed with months to go before their July 3rd deadline. This is the thing. Your average American does not support this. OK, even even many uh, Republicans do not support this. But I feel like this is being done on purpose right before the elections so Trump can come in and pretend to be Mr. Diplomat, you know, like, oh, I understand both sides, you know, I'm going to play the fence. Um, and really, I think what people need to understand is that I don't think Trump is going to run on a platform of a federal abortion ban, and they do not need a federal abortion ban to get to the end goal of what they're trying to accomplish, okay? All that the GOP needs to do is replace the head of the FDA, right, who will then rescind approval for mis mifepristone and misoprostol, the two safe and effective um, first trimester abortion medications. Then what they can do is they can use the Comstock Act. Now, the Comstock Act, I should look it up, but off the top of my head, what I remember is that it, uh, it basically refers to um, inappropriate material being sent in the mail, okay? So this is how people are getting access to abortion medication, even in states where there's total bans. You can still um, have abortion medication sent to you through the mail. Now, 63% of abortions 
are done with these medications. And I've seen so much propaganda and disinformation coming out about how these medications are dangerous. Oh, they're killing women. You know what's killing women? Giving birth in this country. The infant and maternal mortality rates are through the roof. It is extremely dangerous to even give birth in this country, especially when if you have a complication and your baby is killing you or the fetus is killing you, rather. I need to like change my language. I'm just so used to talking like that. If the fetus is killing the mother and it's not viable, the mother will most likely perish as well. So even if you are having a wanted pregnancy and something goes wrong, the risk for your mortality has gone up exponentially because of these bans. So yes, the Comstock Act um, from 1873, um, it's a statute defined contraceptives, contraceptives as obscene and illicit, making it a federal crime. So that is what they're going to use. Something from... 1873 we're literally going back to the 1800s which is it's just such a strange thing <laughs> i couldn't think of the right word when you have we're, we're going in like two completely opposite directions we're going back to the 1800s with our laws and our views on women and we're going into like freaking the future with ai with um all of this crazy deep fake technology it's terrifying. It's like it's like a schizophrenic, like psychotic break where we're going in like two completely opposite directions and neither of them are leading towards happiness. OK, it's extremely it's extremely troubling. It's extremely concerning. And all of you that have daughters, wives, uh, you know, female family members, or if you just care about womankind, like you should be talking to people about this. You should be educating people about this. Because like I've said before, once you open Pandora's box of all this legislation, it is not easy to reverse it. It will take a very long time. And in my opinion, you know, putting my tinfoil hat on for just a moment here, I think that this was all set up so Trump can come in and play savior and play diplomat. Um... I don't know. I'll make my prediction right now. I think that Trump will win. OK, we'll come back and see if I'm right, um, because I think they want to further destabilize things here in this country. And literally a criminal, <laughs> a criminal, a, a, a sexual abuser as our president. I mean, it's just so fitting. Right. I mean, Biden isn't any better. God, they're all they're all they're all predators at that level. They have to be to get to that level. But man, I could, I, I really think that's what we have in store. And me personally, again, with my tinfoil hat on, I don't believe that voting actually dictates the outcome of these things. I feel like these things have been set um, in stone f since a long time ago. We see it in the predictive programming of television shows, movies, right? Like it, it goes back a very long time. And it's interesting because me personally, um, I don't believe that voting at a federal level is going to change anything, but I also am not advocating for the erasure of women's rights via revoking the 19th Amendment because, the, because of the implications that that has. Okay, so I know it's kind of like, oh, well, if you're not, if you don't want to repeal the 19th, why aren't you voting? I don't vote at a, at a federal level personally. Okay. Um, I, I just, I, I don't believe that it actually changes things. So most people, when I tell them that they'll be like, well, then what are we supposed to do? We need to change the culture. <laughs> um, and as women, we need to literally stop surrounding ourselves with men that are abusive and that don't actually help us. Okay. Um, because I, I don't, I hardly see any men talking about, uh, this, the, the erasure of our reproductive rights in this country. Um, everybody just says, oh, well, you, you want the right to murder your baby. Like, they're so uneducated. <laughs> there are so many reasons for uh, an abortion. And so many of them, when they're outside of that 63% that uses the abortion medication in the first trimester, 
So many of them are due to medical reasons, okay? A woman isn't carrying a baby until seven months and then like, you know what? Nah, just, just get rid of it. I don't really want to do this anymore. No, there's there's a reason and they're, and they're much rarer in the second and third trimester. So that's it for the, uh, the abortion coverage here in this beginning part of the show. Now let's get to some clips. All right, so um, trigger warning because we're going to cover some really dark stuff. It's going to be about um, sexual assault of women and getting into basically the history and the origins of the 4B movement. Now the 4B movement, I believe it came out of Korea, but I think Chinese women might have their own as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to do deep research this morning. But um, I, I didn't know how bad it was in Korea, South Korea, obviously. I did not know how misogynistic those men were. I don't know why I didn't assume, like, they're kind of all the same, <laughs> no matter where they are in the world. Um, but I had no idea how misogynistic those men were and the absolute hell that South Korean women have been going through. So I want to share a clip here from Anna Bash. Um, we're going to be going into the origin of the 4B movement, which, sorry, I, I forgot to tell you what it even is. It's basically women withdrawing from all relations with men. So not marrying men, not dating men, not having babies with men, not wearing makeup. Um, and you know, I believe there are some other things as well. And I just think this is fantastic. And I see it spreading here in the United States and I, I applaud it. I applaud it. I've been living the 4B life like accidentally just because I found that my mental health <laughs> is way better um, being single and celibate. Like I'm the happiest I've ever been in my adult life. Like the peace and tranquility that I have because most of the, in most relationships, women, we really don't benefit that much. We're the ones doing like all, we're like pulling the dead weight. Like, come on, come on, let's have empathy. <laughs> let's care about each other's feelings. And the man's just like, Duh. so yeah, <laughs> a lot of us have been like, accidentally living this lifestyle and a lot of men think that it's a manipulation tactic no this is a survival tactic okay <laughs> like when we've exhausted all other options trying begging pleading please catch up with me please evolve and men are like no no I'm gonna go find less because you're just asking for too much you're asking for me to have empathy and that's just crazy so I'm, I'm with these women. Um, I think 4B is fantastic. And I hope it catches on here in the United States. And already, men have, um, men have started a 5G movement, which means that we don't get their sperm. Oh, I'm so sad about that. Damn it. I, I wanted to have another child so I could do all the work and get no thanks for it. <laughs> darn and they're also like not gonna date us like you guys that's what we want okay like that's what we that's what we want um they've been it's basically just MGTOW they've been saying that they're gonna go their own way for like years they're like I'm I'm leaving okay bye we're like go dude go you've been saying you're gonna leave but you're still here like looking to see if we're chasing you we're not we're very happy that you're leaving, but it's seriously just, it seriously reminds me of like a grade school argument on the playground where the boy's like, yeah, well, I didn't want to play with you either. So I'm leaving. The girls are like, yeah, we, we, that's fine. Like go away. Yeah. Well, I am going to go after I stand here for a while and stare at you, but then I'm going to go and, uh, yeah. I'm leaving. And they just never leave. <laughs> and they have to have the last word, right? They always have to have the last word. Like, oh, oh, you guys don't want to be with us anymore? Well, fine. We don't want to be with you. Good. <laughs> Thank you. But they never go away because they need us. They, th they literally need our energy. They feed off of our life force. We give them meaning. <laughs> Women give men meaning. And they need validation from us. They really do. Yes, they need it from other men, but they need it from women too, badly. So I think it's also really important 
if you are living the 4B lifestyle, whatever, or if you're a woman that's happily married, but you don't want to engage with these freaking little peasants, do not have back and forths with them online because they feed off of that immediately block. Or you can respond gray rock style and just say, okay, okay. Or one, another one that I really like to do is, wow, you're extremely emotional right now. And then they're like, I don't even know what to say to that. So block, just block them. Don't have back and forth with them because they will just gaslight you. They'll run you in circles, bunch of word salad. They are not, it's a bad faith argument on their end. Even when they ask a question, I'm genuinely interested. What it, why do you guys not want to be around men? And then you tell them and they're like, but, 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 but. They're not coming from good faith. You'll be able to tell the men that actually care because like they'll genuinely come from a good faith perspective like genuinely trying to understand but it's you can you can see right away when they're full of shit and they're just trying to get into an argument because they are feeding off of your energy okay we are batteries that charge them up that's why there have been studies done showing that when a man sleeps next to a woman he sleeps really well for the most part and a woman sleeps like absolute garbage because they are literally stealing our life force <laughs> Okay, so enough blabbing. Let's get to this clip. All right, Anna Bash. She's replying to Loretta. The comment says, didn't a K-pop artist do that too? How many more bars out there are like this? So just to give a little bit of background here, um, she's going to go into some really awful things that were happening at a nightclub in South Korea and what really started um, sparking the 4B movement. Now, I just want to say similar things are happening here. Women, ladies, if you are going out... Please be careful because now what's happening, bartenders are in on the trafficking scheme, okay? There have been women that have not even ordered an alcoholic drink. They've gone up to the bar because they're meeting a friend or something, and they order an orange juice or a water, and the bartenders are drugging those drinks. And then what they do is once the bartender knows the woman is incapacitated, the bartender contacts the traffickers, they escort her out. And this is how people are getting trafficked. So I really wish we didn't have to live in a world like this, but please just be careful. You know, if you're going out drinking, um, now we have to be afraid of the bartenders too, which is something I never, ever considered. I was always hiding my drink from, from patrons. Like, oh, this creepy man over there, let me cover my drink. And they also have these really cool scrunchies that will cover your drink. Um, I mean, it's just so sad that we live in a world like this. That's why we need women's only nightclubs and bars. Okay, here we go. Everyone needs to go watch this full episode on YouTube. South Korea was the origin of the 4B movement, and I believe this is a huge factor of why it started. The goal for the employees at the Burning Sun is to survey the women coming into the club, pick the prettiest ones that would please the VIPs, get them drunk, them before the vips get there so they can deliver them to the vip the goal would be she said drug them but obviously i guess you know because she's monetized or whatever she had to bleep that out but i'll say it because i am not monetized so yeah <laughs> nothing to lose here so they they find the prettiest girl in line they drug them and then they deliver them to the vips you know just like a literal product not a human not a woman she is beautiful. She is beyond the point of consent. The VIP is happy. Because now the VIP doesn't have to waste his time getting her drunk so that he can essay her. He can just go ahead and do whatever he wants to her illegally. VIP is happy. The employees get a big tip. That is the ultimate goal of the employees at Burning Sun. And nothing makes them happier than watching the literal essay of a young woman. They would text videos into their group chat of VIPs are wording unconscious women. They would text things like, look at the VIP room right now, they're doing it. So it's up to the employees to get girls into that state quickly and discreetly. Their solution was date. They, employee. The solution was Rohypnol. Sometimes even bartenders would date the own, their own female customers, which, you know, a few things about this are so terrifying. How easy it is to spike someone's drink, terrifying. But also, I imagine, if I went to a club, I might be cautious of strange men around me, but I don't think I would ever be really cautious that the bartender would spike my drink the or that the employees would. Yeah, especially Burning Sun, one of the most, like, famous club. High-end. Most high-end club, like, yeah. what? The employees would dig 
over their own female customers to serve them on a silver platter for higher paying male VIP customers who came to essay the female customers. They woman essayed them took pictures and videos of the assaults created a product catalog of the victims to see if other vips wanted to pay to essay these victims as well that was the real business model of burning sun they were in theory running a complicated trafficking ring and they got away with it for a very long time not because they're flying under the radar and never getting called out on it it's because they were being so blatant about it. There is a saying, I believe in German, and it's translated into English as, the devil was covering it with its own tail. And it's in reference to something being so out in the open, it's basically right under your nose. But you miss it because the devil has just barely hit it out of plain view. <laughs> like hiding in plain sight. Mm -hmm. The Burning Sun's reputation was the tail. The club was owned by a well-known Korean celebrity and a bunch of investors. But in order to experience the full menu of the Burning Sun, you have to be a consistent VIP. This is going to open you up to a whole new world. When a VIP walks in through the door, first of all, they get a separate entrance. And if you spend around $10,000 a night, you get two guards to accompany you. And they are also kind of like your butlers. The employees in the club know when a vip walks in and they all cater to that person all night long making sure that everything they could possibly want under the sun they've got it full service side note a lot of these employees would spend their time working as merchandisers this is a very important position at the burning sun the vip merchandisers are almost like personal shoppers personal concierges butlers for the night and they usually try to plan ahead for the vip's needs over the weekend on Thursday, every merchandiser from the Burning Sun sends out text messages. But instead of promoting cover fees being discounted or alcohol sets being on special, they were sending pictures and videos of women. All unconscious women, they were naked and had just been essayed by other employees or VIPs. The merchandisers believed that these vi women, these victims, could be victimized again. So it's just a matter of which one the VIPs wanted. Under each picture or video of a girl was a price to drug and essay the girl. They're selling essay. They're not even selling. They're selling. So they're going to what? Lure what? the girls back in. Wow. So they get their numbers usually the weekend before when they're and lure them back in. And just like how the alcohol specials changed every week, the girls changed every week. The merchandisers would text the VIP, you can have this one, or how about this one? Or you can like this, a kind of playing like this. So they're referencing videos, like you can also do it like this. Or texts that read, I can make you a reservation guest. If you come, I can get you this girl. If there was more than one VIP client that wanted the same girl that weekend, they would open a bid. The clients would bid auction on the woman who had no idea that any of this was even happening. Many of the club investors and VIP clients were wealthy businessmen from other countries. Also, everybody who was involved in this, all the monsters, are now walking free. Of course they are. The longest sentence, I believe, was a few years for all these heinous crimes against women. Everyone needs to go off. Yeah. Sounds like things are really, really great over there. Okay, this is editing me. Um, I have a follow-up on what happened, um, the lack of repercussions really that happened to those engaged and how this is it, it the same thing is happening in la and this woman who we're going to hear from um is exposing it and she basically is saying that like the guy that's orchestrating all this trafficking stuff at, in la like the bartenders in on it you know spiking the drinks all that um that he's basically the next jeffrey epstein that's going to hopefully be exposed so i just want to play this clip because it kind of ties up some loose ends about what happened with the club in South Korea and what's happening to women in America, how we are all under attack all over the world, and uh, these men are getting away with it for now. So let's hear from this woman. And um, once again, her name is Anna Bash. So she um, is responding to a comment that says, how can they be walking free? What? Uh, that's the majority of male predators are walking free uh, with zero repercussions. Okay. 
Yes, and not only walking free, like literally living their best lives. So there were many guilty parties involved, but Sung Lee, the main one who created this club to drug and sell women, he served 18 months. Yeah, he didn't even have to register as a sex offender. Sung Lee even text, and which girl are you going to bring? Get the kids who give it easily. Get the kids who gives easily? Yeah, like as in, it's easy to essay. He's still getting booked for shows. He's still being greeted as a god by some fans. Which I'm sorry, I don't understand. What what appeal does this man have to any woman? Meanwhile, his victims endure a life sentence of pain and trauma. There were even chat logs that described how JJY and four of his friends took turns on a victim who was drugged. They joked about how she woke up saying she doesn't even remember anything other than having a drink with them. They also talked about how they thought it was so funny they had gang essayed her while taking pictures. And then the next morning, JJY went to a fan sign. So, I mean, it's crazy he had the nerve to look his predominantly female fans in the eyes while smiling at them when he had just done one of the worst things that you could do to a woman the night before. And all of the VIP clients, they essentially got away with it for essay. It's just unbelievable to think that these monsters who got like a little slap on the wrist and they're currently parting it up and living their best lives, and including all the police officials that were involved. It's definitely what's happening in L.A. We basically need what happened with Burning Sun, where a tech employee got access to the phone that would bring down the whole establishment because of the overwhelming incriminating evidence against multiple players in this horrific trafficking ring and abuse of women. Now, I will say that when he finally did turn in the evidence after the whistleblower Kim, so he saw that and he was like, I think, you know, along with all the other anonymous women that were coming out, he was like, I think this is the time that people would actually listen and not think that these are fake. He was very smart. He hired an attorney who was also very smart, and they decided instead of handing it over to the police, who were foaming at the mouth for this, they handed it over to the Civil Rights Commission office, and that is how a lot of it became public, because the police would have never made this public the police were in on it most likely they were paid off or they were participants same thing that's going on here in this country okay. so yeah this is a thousand percent going on in la i made a video about my theory of who the next epstein is a billionaire bar owner in la after it went viral la times reached out to me and i'm currently connecting all the victims to them the more stuff goes public the more we have a chance of stopping this so if you have any information contact me and i'll give you my contact at la times info yeah uh this makes perfect sense to me because like i worked in the nightlife industry when i was in new york city i was a bottle girl i was a bartender freaking you know i lived that horrible lifestyle and i remember all of those most of those venues were owned by the mafia like i was getting paid above board but like you just you just got the vibe you just got the vibe um so it would not be a stretch to say, OK, these organized crime rings that own these establishments have the bartenders in on it, the bouncers in on it, the, you know, everybody's in on it. Everyone gets hush money or, you know, threatened um, like the organized crime is known for doing. And they are profiting off of this bringing in their VIPs. Like, this is the world that we live in. Is this the world you want your children to grow up in? Even if you don't have a daughter. You think your son is going to escape predators too? Like, predators, yeah, they prey on women, absolutely. But there are predators that prey on little children and boys. Um, like, so no wonder they're, they're doing the 4B movement there. It's literally survival. It's a survival strategy. Like where women are trying to protect themselves. I don't know if you guys hear the cranes. They're flying over right now. They're so freaking loud. Um, but it's it's a survival tactic because, you know, even we, we have to worry about m male violence from strangers, but really women should be worrying the most about intimate partner violence because you have more of a probability of being abused by someone that's very close to you than you do um, a stranger. So it's, it's sad. But I see 4B as a self-preservation tactic, and I'm so happy to see women putting their foot down and saying enough is enough. We, like, we cannot 
be victimized. Like we've tried everything and we refuse, we refuse to be, um, prey. And this is happening here too. Okay. It just hasn't been exposed on a grand scale. Like the rising sun. I'm sorry. I forget the name of the club. This is a high end club. Okay. This is not like some, you know, like freaking dive bar or something. This is like a high end elite club. And like she said, these men are walking free. I mean, me personally, every single man that has sexually abused me and physically abused me is walking free. Zero consequences. Um, and my story is not unique. <laughs> That's most women's story. Um, so, yeah. I wonder why they're having a 4B movement. <laughs> Like it is a survival tactic. We're not e we're not even trying to get men to change at this point because they're they aren't and like they won't. A lot of them will not. They're just going to be alone and die alone and they deserve it. So, all right, let's move on. Actually, real quick. Um not only are those men that I mentioned that have um done heinous horrible things to me, not only are they walking free, a lot of them are seen as heroes pretty sick. All right. So this is from engineer mom, one of my favorites on TikTok. Um, so she's going to be talking about how men use sales tactics on women in dating. And this, this clicked, this made so much click for me. I was like, Oh my God, that's literally, they've been cold calling and like cold approaching me. <laughs> like that's what they do because they see us as a product. So they're like, I got to close this sale. I got it. No means, no means press on harder. Like, no, no, no. It means leave me alone. But okay. So, um, it says here, sales tactics are not safe for dating. Believe it or not, guys, it's, uh, it's not how you get women. Men are using business sales techniques on women. How many men do you know that would read books about how to be better at sales or how to be better at business, how to be a better business partner, how to win over coworkers, how to become a leader? And they're telling men that their business success and their personal success are all the same thing. And this one, this one is the most dangerous one. The book says how to turn a no into a yes. And this is the way that a lot of men view relations with women. If a woman says, no, I don't want to do this. He's like, that just really means convince me more. <laughs> I've experienced it myself. I could literally be like, no, I don't feel comfortable. No, I don't want to do this. And they just keep pressing on. And if that's ever happened to you, ladies, and you gave in, that man, that man raped you, okay? He did. And he had no problems with it. It was a really sad day when I, when I realized that because it was men that were supposed to love me and men that said that they wanted to protect me, but they, they victimized me. And I know that's happened to like 99% of women. So if you say no, and then you finally give in, you were raped and it's not your fault. I know it's hard to realize. I didn't want to admit it to myself, but that's coercion and coercion is rape. Okay. Because men confront women that they want to date or are interested in talking to or getting to know, and they hear no, and we've been saying no is no for so long, but men have been conditioned that a no is a yes with a request for more information. So they use their training about overcoming fear and failure and rejection, and they press on. I need to get, I need to follow her around and tell her more. She just needs to know more. She, she's a yes. And instead of reading books about what women want or getting to know women, or we reading women's books about women, they're reading these or seeing this or hearing the, the blurbs of this from the people that take it from the book to social media or just in conversation that this is everything. That the, the, that the sales technique is everything in life. And men to just, and men to just practice these habits. You know the scariest? I was thinking that, like, sharpen the saw. <laughs> like, do this every day. Also the phrase, like, sharpen the saw. Yeah, that was the name, the name of one of the books, sharpen the saw. Like, uh, okay, friggin' murderer. It's, like, so scary when you think about applying these ten habits to dating. <laughs> like, dating 
is not sales. It is not that you are trying to sell yourself to somebody else. I mean, it can be if it's transactional business relationship type stuff, but it's more like I'm in my world doing my thing and trying to attract the things in my life that are that make it better, that enhance it. I don't I'm not selling that to anyone. And anyone that comes at me with their 10 highly effective habits and rainmaking technique, and I know that you want to go out with me, I know you're saying no, but you just need more information. I'm overcoming any obstacle, and I was taught to fight through this fear of rejection and keep at it. It is terrifying to be come at by men in this way, like man after man after man. And there are examples of stories that we have seen even recently of women getting like the, giving the ultimate no and rejection. And because it isn't business, because it's not a business deal where you have to like shake hands with a person and say, thank you. And maybe sometime in the future, or I'll circle back in six months and see how you're doing. It is in the, in the moment of knowing that that might be their last, their first and only shot that they cannot take the ultimate no from the sales training that they had, that it, it's a yes, it's eventually going to be a yes. And if it's not a yes, they're going to force it to be a yes, or there's consequences. And I honestly think that that is just, um, a, that is just them losing, like ultimately losing the game, like losing overall, like losing the battle, losing the war, and not being able to process or handle the fact that they have been convincing themselves and other people have been convincing them through these snippets, these lists and these books that if you just do X, Y, Z and practice it really hard, you'll be successful in business. Oh, also this applies to anybody. You can use this on any person in life for anything. And I know that it is scary to say this to someone. I just block and delete, ghost, blur, vanish. It is that sometimes for women that is not possible. Like it, you will be. It's it's dangerous. <laughs> and saying to a man, I know in business that sometimes a no is a yes or a no is a maybe with a request for more information. But this is not business. This is me and my personal life, and it's really just like an all the way no, forever. And if that's not a possibility of something to be shared, we have to go into, like, I'm fighting for my life mode. I don't know what this person's going to do mode. He may be sharpening the saw mode. Hand him a book on rainmaking and selling, and then hand him a book on women and how to communicate with women. Written by a woman. And if he's willing to read both and discuss the differences, the vast differences in those two concepts and possibilities and strategies and strategies even, it's not a strategy, um, but, you know, in a, the way that a man might think, the strategies, the coping mechanisms, how to deal with failure, like to look, to compare and analyze the difference between those two conversations, he, there may be a chance that he might get it. I'm going to disagree with that, okay? I think that's doing way too much. We are not teaching grown men, okay? Unless you're getting paid to be a teacher, <laughs> we are not doing that anymore, okay? He will go and find the books by women if he wants them, but they don't, so... I see where she's coming from, and I'm not um, hating on her at all. My God, I love her. Um, but, like, we're, we're not doing that, okay? <laughs> we're not teaching grown men. They know what they're doing, okay? They just don't care. So I used to try this. I used to be like, read this book. This will explain it. No. Why am I spoon-feeding information to a grown man? <laughs> like, if he wanted to learn, he would, and he doesn't. So, like... Don't waste your energy. Just revoke access to you. That's literally all we can do. And it is actually an extreme... It's it's where we hold our power as women. And women are finally starting to realize that. So, awesome. All right, moving on. 
Okay, so now we're going back to Jenny, one of our favorites here on the podcast. She's an ex-Mormon. She has done so much great work exposing the LDS church. I don't even know what they're supposed to be called anymore. I think they recently changed it from like Mormonism to LDS or something. I don't even know. Um, But she's going to get into how that church, LDS, Mormons, whatever, um, how it's basically a huge uh, trafficking ring. And it absolutely is. And this is extremely important information. Um, And I think a lot of people don't see the LDS church as a threat. Um, They've got their eyes on other targets that are doing just as bad of things. But the LDS church has bought up like huge swaths of land in the United States. And they have a huge propaganda machine out there. Um like with their uh, ballerina farms and, you know, this Mormon and that Mormon. So I think it's something that people should have on their radars. <laughs> They're not just like this, ah, oh, this little fringe group. No, they have immense power in this country. And uh, it's a big tra- trafficking ring, which Jenny is going to expose here. So she's responding to a comment that says, I cannot help but think of the whole trad wife thing as just another form of human trafficking, especially after watching things like Be Sweet, Pray, and Obey and Shiny Happy People. Yep. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not and never was a Christian religion. It has been, at its core from the very beginning, a sex club. And the entire structure of the organization to this day is designed to groom, indoctrinate, and then traffic girls like myself to their eternal companions. Unlike traditional Christianity, which teaches that salvation is dependent on accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, taught that eternal life is dependent on a concept that he called the new and everlasting covenant, which specifically to me as an active believing Mormon meant marriage in the temple for time and all of eternity to a worthy companion. While most mainstream Christian churches teach that marriage is till death do us part, Joseph Smith and the current Mormon church teach the doctrine that marriage is the foundation of eternal life that husband and wife when sealed in the temple under the new and everlasting covenant, if they're faithful, will rise in the resurrection to become gods and goddesses. That the very purpose of coming to earth to get bodies is to find your celestial partner. To marry in the temple can become gods. A quote from a Mormon prophet that perfectly illustrates this doctrine is, as man is, God once was, and as God is, man can become, indicating that it is our purpose to die and become gods ourselves. Within Mormonism, if a man does not marry a woman in the temple, he cannot qualify for eternal life and godhood. Joseph Smith also taught, and this is still the doctrine of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that a man can have an infinite number of wives. While this was discontinued here on earth by the Brigmite Church out of Utah, it is still the doctrine for the afterlife. Okay, how is this different from Islam, right? You've got all these, like, Christians and Mormons like, Islam, well, such a threat, blah, blah, blah. You guys are the exact same. Like, hello, the call is coming from inside the house. You guys literally believe the same garbage. <laughs> oh, this, the Islamification of this country. Like, uh, the Christian fascism of this country, too. You both suck. You both suck. Mrs. Smith was so obsessed with acquiring a harem that many of the key doctrines of the church and much of his time while he was building up the kingdom of Nauvoo were focused on just that. Doctrines, policies, revelations, scripture, temple ordinances, and commands around the pursuit and acquisition of eternal concubines for himself and his inner circle. It stood in a concise yet hard to listen to rundown of the early trafficking of females by Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. Head on over to Mormon Stories Podcast on YouTube and find this episode. Like I said, the days of polygamy have been behind the LDS Church for many decades. But female members like myself are still being groomed, indoctrinated, and then eventually trafficked to worthy Mormon men within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today because of this key doctrine of the new and everlasting covenant. Let me take a little pause for a moment to define once again a basic definition of trafficking. The unlawful act of transporting or coercing people in order to benefit from their work or service, typically in the form of forced labor or sexual exploitation. I was born in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and from as young as I can remember, I was groomed for one purpose and one purpose only, to be the sexual partner of a worthy Mormon priesthood holder. This indoctrination took the form of 
primary songs. I love to see the temple. I'm going there someday. I'll covenant with my father. I'll promise to obey. <sighs> Mary Miss classes starting when I was a young adolescent, teaching me homemaking skills. The entire Young Women's Program, which is a six-year goal-setting institution, structured kind of loosely like a Boy Scouts of America type of thing called Personal Progress, where all of the goals are focused on turning the young women into wives and mothers. Wow. Okay. We're going to pause for a second. This is extremely sad. Like, can you imagine? That's what you're told your value is as a young girl. You're a baby machine and you're a domestic servant. Now, do I think it's wrong to teach boys and girls domestic skills? No, no. But here's where it becomes a problem. They don't teach girls how to fix things. They teach us to be reliant on men. And I've had to teach myself um, a lot of these skills out of sheer necessity. But you know what I realized? Okay, men have been gatekeeping lawn care. It is like the easiest thing ever. And it's actually very enjoyable. <laughs> because you're out in the sun you put on a podcast you don't have to listen to children screaming mom mom i want a snack like you're just out there doing your own thing you know a lot of that stuff that men are like oh who's gonna change the oil like um the people at the freaking valvoline quick thing <laughs> like those guys um and, and a lot of these tasks that they claim that they are so needed for are only done like a couple times a year like yeah anyways um but that's that's my perspective. I think that it's important to teach domestic tasks to boys and girls and teach them both how to fix things, how to repair things, and for girls, how to use pulleys and levers to lift heavy things. Okay, let's let her finish. It's a poster from the Mormon church that I had on my wall as a middle school girl. And if you can't, obviously you can't see the poster. It says, you have exactly one job. And it's a little blonde girl with a pink bow in her hair looking into a mirror of her and her future husband and like some Mormon temple behind them. This is the propaganda little girls are getting in the Mormon church. You have exactly one job and that's to be a wife and mother. That's it. That's it. No. No nope that's actually not our one job and not every woman should be a mother or wants to be some women want to be ceos some in, some women want to be lawyers some women want to work on an oil rig okay and they actually do believe it or not and grooming me for only one option in life and that is to marry a worthy priesthood holder in the mormon temple for time and all of eternity so that i could be his eternal concubine you have exactly one job. When I was 14 years old, which, by the way, is exactly the age that my son is now, I had my Mormon fortune read. It's called a patriarchal blessing. This patriarchal blessing for a believing Mormon is a very convincing indoctrination tool. My patriarchal blessing is about a page and a half long. All but one paragraph of that patriarchal blessing talks about my role as a wife and mother. It names specifically that I will have two sons and two daughters, talks about how I will meet my husband, talks about that I will marry in the temple, talks about the celestial home that I will... I'm sorry, are they freaking reading Tarot? <laughs> Is this literally Mormon Tarot? <laughs> like, they're doing tarot card readings, but it's a patriarchal reading. Like, what the hell? For that husband and how I will spend eternity sitting on a throne next to him with our children at our feet <laughs> as his celestial companion. Oh this patriarchal blessing that I received as a 14-year-old girl made me obsessed with finding my eternal companion so that I could marry, mate, propagate children, and prepare for my eternal life. My indoctrination was so complete and so absolute that I saw no options for my wife outside of getting married and having babies. While my other 25-year-old friends were finishing up college, getting their first job, backpacking across Europe, I was in the middle of being a breeder for my Mormon husband, with whom oh, sorry. I would eventually have one adopted and four biological children. Now, by the way, her, her eternal celestial uh, god-priest-man husband cheated on her with sex workers that were, like, 19. 
so they were trafficked as well, right? I guess he just needed a different flavor of trafficked woman. He had the goody two shoes trafficked woman, but he was like, you know, I want to spice things up. I want to go exploit a drug addicted teenage concubine, which he eventually, I believe, uh, entered a relationship with the 19 year old trafficked young lady, most likely addicted to drugs, extremely sad situation. Um, he also gave his wife, his ex wife here, Jenny, uh, an STD. And look, Jenny did everything perfectly. She did everything that a good Mormon wife is supposed to do. And what did it get her? An STD. Um, she almost she almost took her own life because can you imagine? Can you imagine you've been groomed since girlhood to think that this is it? All this hard work paid off. All the pain of pushing those babies out. All the sleepless nights. All the you know trouble and toil for nothing. He left her, took all the money. She was living in her car. This is why I just want to shake these little 20-year-olds that are like, it wouldn't happen to me. Uh, like, you guys. Yes, it will. <laughs> Maybe for some it doesn't. Bless your heart. I'm glad that didn't happen to you. But it is extremely common. And just listening to Jenny, and this is just like such a beautiful soul inside and out, like, to see how resilient women are. Now, I, I don't like always um, using that as, like, women are strong. Basically, our strength is dictated by how much abuse we can tolerate, right? I, I hate that. So I'm not trying to, you know, frame it in that way. But just seeing that this woman just refused refused to give up. And I think a lot of that, speaking personally, has to do with having children. It's like, we, we can't give up. Like, we, we cannot. We, they need us. I know if I didn't have a child, I probably would have given up <laughs> a long time ago. Um, but, okay, let's let Jenny finish here. But this is just such, she's such a, such an important voice right now for women. And I'm so glad that we have social media for this purpose because before TikTok and all these, you know, social media sh video sharing platforms, like we were not able to connect with each other and tell our stories. That's why they want us isolated. They want us isolated. One woman stuck at home taking care of all the children and not a communal thing. And no, this doesn't mean that I'm a proponent of communism because I believe that the nuclear family is just not... It's not a working model. We can have, like, you know, two-parent households, but there needs to be an extended community. One woman cannot do it all on her own. It's cruel. It's not, it's not viable. And it's not sustainable. One of the main components necessary for a system to be defined as trafficking is somebody has to benefit. When Mormonism was founded, Joseph Smith himself, who, again, was founding a sex club benefited with beautiful young European converts that he could add to his harem. He was averaging two polygamist wives a month during the Nauvoo period. Jeez. He inherited many of their family estates and also received the loyalty of some of their parents and brothers and other people who were instrumental in making the matches. Some of the men that he trafficked girls to received promises of blessings of eternal life. Some of them received high callings in the church, gifts of land and other properties. Both the church itself and the individual priesthood leader men, like Brigham Young the prophet, benefited from the labor force, the missionary force, and ultimately the financial gain of the very industrious free labor that the wives and children of these men produced. Some of Brigham Young's wives and children mined steel, ran the church bison farms Slavery. on Antelope Island, managed the honeybee farm, oversaw the mill. These men reaped the benefits of the sexual and labor aspects of trafficking, and so does the Mormon church today. I always thought that I was raised in the gospel for my eternal exaltation, that all my young women's and Mary Miss classes were about me, so that I could have eternal life with Jesus. But the truth of the matter is that if my ex-husband hadn't had girls like me that were pure and sweet and temple-worthy to marry, statistics show if Jake had married a non-member that he had a very low chance of staying within the church. And if he didn't stay in the church, he wouldn't have paid the hundreds of thousands of dollars in tithing. He wouldn't have served 20 to 40 hours a week in our wards in state. He wouldn't have raised the five children who also served in the church and financially contributed. My son who served a two-year mission and converted others who are now financially contributing. Real quick, 
I, I know I'm not trying to like correct her, but Jenny raised those kids. Okay. That their husband didn't do shit. <laughs> she raised those children and continues to raise them. My Mormon upbringing wasn't about me and it wasn't about my internal life. It was grooming and indoctrination so that LDS Inc. could traffic me to a worthy priesthood holder. And there are more doctrines within Mormonism that I can possibly talk about in a 10 minute TikTok video. Dependency of the trafficking victims on their Mormon priesthood holding husbands. The prophetic counsel for women to marry young before they complete their educations and to have as many children as they can and to stay at home and be nurturers and housewives. This system set me up as a trafficking victim to my priesthood holding husband to be utterly dependent on him. I was trapped in a system that I couldn't leave. The inability to cancel a temple ceiling. When I was a 20-year-old girl and had been married for just a few weeks, my husband was already abusive. But the Mormon church holds your temple ceiling, and you cannot file for or sue for or in any way get a divorce unless the Mormon prophet approves it. The doctrines around divorce, which kept me in a constant state of fear that if I ever left my husband, that I would lose my eternal life and live in Mormon hell lose my children, lose the protection in this life of my temple covenant. Joseph Smith, the founding prophet of Mormonism, may have died almost 200 years ago, but the pimp daddy of Nauvoo's sex trafficking ring still operates in full force today because of the meticulous system that he founded. Wow. Wow. Like, can you imagine? Can you imagine? They trap these women. They trap them. They traffic them. They exploit them. And I never was part of the Mormon church, but I was trafficked by them. And I don't know if, if we have new listeners here. I'm not going to take too long getting into it. But the Mormons out in Utah and, you know, surrounding states, they have a for-profit private prison industry for troubled teens um, where they have people abduct you in the middle of the night. I was abducted by two strangers. Come to find out that the people that run that escort company, that's what they call their kidnapping organization, an escort service, um, come to find out the guy who ran that was a sexual predator. Um, I wasn't preyed on sexually during my kidnapping. Um, but yes, uh, I was kidnapped and trafficked, um, thousands of miles away from my home. I was living in Connecticut at the time. I was trafficked all the way out to Utah. They got me on a plane. They threatened to handcuff me. Um, I just, I, I like, I, I can't even explain to you guys how horrible that was. Um, like I still choke up about it and I'm 35 and it happened when I was like 14. So it really did impact me. I still have nightmares. Um, but yeah, it, the people that ran these programs, which were just prisons and psychological um, brainwashing torment centers, uh, were Mormons. And there was zero therapy going on at these places, at least not traditional therapy. They had attack therapy where they would yell at you, call you a whore, tell you it's your fault that you were sexually abused. They would make young girls who had abortions carry around bags of flour all day to be like, that's the baby you killed. You have to carry that weight with you for the rest of your life these girls were like 12 they should have had a baby according to the mormon church they should have so the these uh mormon men profited off of very vulnerable parents okay yes people are like i'd never talk to my parents ever again but i have healed things with my parents and i have i had empathy because all of these professionals were telling them your daughter's gonna die if you don't send her there i was i was not in a good place you know like i was having behavioral issues i was skipping out on class i was um suicidal okay my teenage years were very hard um so my parents were desperate they didn't know what to do but that certainly wasn't <laughs> helpful I've, you know, I've been in therapy. I've, you know, unpacked a lot of this. I've healed a lot of things with my parents. Um, but really, I believe that we were both victims of the Mormon mafia. We truly were because all of these doctors that recommended the program, you know, to save our lives as troubled teens, they got money for that. They got money for it. Yeah. So, um, I had to live in a Mormon brainwashing facility for almost two years. I was there for 20 months. And 
they brainwashed us okay they told us um they told us that we were dirty and unclean that we had to like come clean and and get all the truth off of our chest so eventually they just started implanting false stories in us and making us talk about them as if they really happened like if you didn't have enough trauma to to talk about in group or whatever group therapy which was not therapeutic at all these people were not even licensed um then you were dirty and they had my group never wore these bracelets but they had all of the therapists were mormon okay they had these women in another group which we called them families <laughs> hello cult indoctrination they had them wear bracelets that said choose the right now this is a mormon phrase that is about choose the right make the right choice make the right choice um so we were we were indoctrinated they couldn't do it outright because parents might be like hey Hey, I'm okay with you psychologically tormenting my child, but not putting Mormonism into their head. So they never came out right with it. But like, for example, we weren't allowed to have caffeine because Mormons weren't allowed to have caffeine. Our staff, who were just wardens, basically, they were like polygamist women that had like the polygamist swoop. They all had a particular hairstyle that they would do. So I think they were like a fundamental LDS, which is like even scarier than your mainstream LDS. So I have a, I have a different perspective. I wasn't raised in it, but I was sent to one of their prisons and some of, some of us didn't make it out alive. Okay. Some people died there. My friend, Erica, bless her heart. She actually escaped the facility one night and she got on the roof. What a badass. Like, I remember when I when I saw them dragging her in the next day, she was covered in bruises because they had these big fat Samoan guys that would like tackle us if we tried to run. So they beat the shit out of her. And I remember them dragging her into a group in the morning and they would have you wear basically like a bright orange, like almost jumpsuit if you were like in trouble. And they would isolate you in a padded cell for, you know, hours, days upon days. I remember they dragged her in and just seeing my friend like that, I was like, I'll never try to escape. I don't want to die. And plus, we were in the middle of the desert. Like, where the hell are we going to go? And they had us wearing uniforms, so everyone would see a girl running down the street. They'd be like, yeah, come get her. All the locals were in on it, too, because it that created jobs in this little podunk town. I think it was called Laverkin. Laverkin, Utah. That's where I was imprisoned. And, like, they wouldn't even let us look out the windows, OK, like it. I mean, I still have nightmares to this day. So I know I was only in that for 20 months. I cannot imagine being raised in that birthing children for these awful, awful men being abused by these men and having nowhere to go. And this happens in the Christian church, too, in the Catholic church. I mean, all religions, all religions. And even obviously abuse happens to non-religious people. But what I'm saying is in these institutions, women will come to the pastor or whoever and say, I'm being abused. And they'll be like, well, I just think that you should be a little nicer to your husband. And then maybe he won't be the shit out of you. Like, oh, my God. And they wonder why women are just done, just completely done. Our survival depends on it. That we can't take anymore, <laughs> nor should we have to. We never should have had to experience the things that we did in the first place. No one ever protected me. Where, where are all these protector men? Well, they were the ones trafficking us, <laughs> okay, and abusing us and, and withholding communication from our family. They wouldn't even let you talk to your family until, until you were thoroughly indoctrinated. I mean, I could talk about this for hours, but that's not what this show is about. If you want to, if you want me to do a whole episode on that, I could, because it's really crazy. And I'm so glad that a lot of people that I was in the program with are coming forth and are sharing their stories. And I believe there's a big documentary being done about it. So that's cool. But let's play like, we'll play like one more clip and then we're going to be done for the day. All right. So this last clip is going to be from a man criticizing another man, which we love to see it. We love it. Okay, so this is from Peace Here, Love Now. He's dunking on Womp Guy. <laughs> I guess that's Womp Tomp. That's the guy um, saying all this dumb stuff. And he really thought he did something. Like, you can tell he's like, <laughs> gotcha, ladies. <laughs> like, no, Womp, Womp, Womp. No, you don't. Um, so let's listen to Peace Here, Love Now's commentary on Womp Guy. Isn't it kind of 
it funny that now that women work, all the jobs they do are just stuff they would have done at home? Like, y'all really convince women to go take care of other people's children and other sick people and go manage other people's finances and stuff. Okay, I just gotta stop right there, okay? Because women were doing all these jobs before, they just weren't being paid for it. <laughs> Who do you think were school teachers? It's not like, it's not like men were doing all this uh, nursing and you know, midwifery and all this teaching, and then feminism came along and displaced those men from those jobs. No, women just weren't paid. Okay, I'll shut up. I'm just doing that for their family. Hey, it's me again. He's arguing to take a step backwards based on revisionist history. This guy grossly underestimates the diversity and importance of women's work. Liberation is not a laughing matter. And in doing so, now you've doubled the tax base, and if they don't want to work, their husband has to work twice as hard, and also convince them that even if he is working 80 hours a week, he has to come home and do 50% of the chores. It's both undignified and unjust to blame the consequences of late-stage American capitalism on women. It's almost like the whole point of this was like to turn women into wage slaves and like break the American family in half by like commodifying their natural proclivities and telling them that being a stay-at-home mom is a bad idea. It's almost like the whole point of this is to give women a choice so that people like him can't force women to stay at home raising a man's children. This argument is in such bad faith, it's not worth engaging except to dispel his delusion. Which era do you think he's romanticizing? There's only a few choices here. Is it the 1960s? Or maybe he's thinking post-war. How can we forget that the recent past was characterized by toil, hardship, and slavery? To buy whatever he's selling requires you to lionize masculinity while diminishing femininity. Now we have like half the successful marriages, half the children being born, and your dollar goes half as far. Ha ha, yay! And ladies, by the way, if you find a good guy, which is not a guy who will use you as a human fleshlight that you met at the club, and if enough of them succeed, what does that really say about you? All that man wants is cooking, cleaning, children, and shut up every once in a while. Frustrated men like him are unable to have this conversation without telling on themselves. It's also wildly disrespectful when he reduces the wonderful diversity of men into a binary. Apparently, the bad man is sexually corrupt, but the good man just wants domestic labor and for you to shut the hell up. We need to be more honest. We're not suffering because of feminism. We're suffering because of violence and political and economic corruption. Facts. Freedom is fundamentally more complex than subjugation. There's more choices to be made, and there's more independent agents. Those who suffer when others are liberated are called oppressors and tyrants. This is not a finished product. Humanity is a blossoming phenomenon, and there are consequences of freedom. If you find yourself unable to cope with the consequences of liberation, you need to open your heart and your mind, because nobody is going to do the work for you. Isn't it okay, I, I believed this garbage years ago, okay? Because the men that were leading me, the leaders, were telling me this garbage. They would repeat these lies over and over again, and everyone would be like, yes, that's so true. Feminism is responsible for usury and fractional reserve banking. Yeah, that makes so much sense, bro. Like, no, okay? It's <laughs> the economy and the way that our money is created and loaned out to our government by a private corporation and we have to pay back the interest, interest that we can never pay back. It's a debt-based currency. We are all debt slaves. And by the nature of that system, we have inflation. So it's like, it's honestly, honestly, these men are PR geniuses. Like, I will give them that. Because they seriously have convinced so many people that women getting paid for some of our labor, okay, we don't even get freaking compensated for most of it. Uh, and also we get paid less on average. They they convinced us that women getting compensated for some work or having the freedom to leave a marriage, to have a credit card, to own property, um, to be able to rent, which w single women could not do before sometime in the 70s. They convinced us that that's the, that's the reason why the economy sucks. <laughs> and also, they also live in delusion land where they're like my grandmother didn't work if your grandmother didn't work it's because you're rich 
and you were born into money and you're a little trust fund kid, okay? My grandmother freaking worked. Both of my grandmothers worked. One of them worked on the farm for free and birthed 11 children for free um, and got really nothing in return except a pot to piss in, literally, because they had no plumbing. That was my Irish grandmother. Then my American grandmother worked. She was a nurse. She was a professor. She was a very intelligent woman, and I... I'm so happy that I had that example. She was a college professor and a nurse practitioner. Like, she could prescribe medicine. What a badass. Love you, Nani. Rest in peace. Love you, love you. Redhead, blue eyes, drop-dead gorgeous woman. She's German. Um, They've really convinced us that feminism is to blame for pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Men failing at life, feminism. Men, men lonely because nobody wants to be around them because they're so insufferable. Feminism. Women not wanting to date you. Feminism. Like, yeah, sounds like a personal problem. And just, just like the smugness that these men, like the look that they have on their face, they really think they're like doing something. They're like, (laughs) try and refute that people. Like, yeah, it's very easy to refute that, sir. Like, God damn, they just, they will so confidently say the wrong things that are not based in reality, like with their whole chest and be like very proud of it too. It's just, it's, it should be studied. The amount of audacity and delusions, like it is on another level. Like we should be able to harness this audacity to power the world. (laughs) Can we like, can we like convert male audacity into like electricity or something that then it might actually have value. You know what? I actually changed my mind. I want to play one more clip about this Bondi stabbing because it's recent and um, I want to cover it now. And Cecilia Regina from TikTok, Cecilia Regina 275 is her official handle. Um, She just never misses. Like, her commentary is just spot freaking on every time. And um, I want to play this because she says it better than I ever could. And it's very important. And then we will end the show for this week. So let's hear from Cecilia. So by now you have heard about this mall attack in Australia where this man targeted women, according to the police there. And yes, he did unalive uh, six victims altogether, five women, one man, this security guard who tried to prevent him. And he did injure several other people, including a nine-month-old baby girl. Firstly, peace to all the victims of this man and their families in this very difficult and trying time. And speedy recovering to all the victims who are uh, still in critical condition. But I see a lot of people, like, misapprehending what's happening here. Mostly two camps. They're saying, oh my god, you know, it's happening. Men are getting more and more violent. And these men, his own father got on, you know, the news and said, oh, he couldn't get a girlfriend. Oh, he had these mental problems, blah, blah, blah. And the police have confirmed he was targeting women. Real quick, when they interviewed the father, I think it was really interesting how he said, you guys see a monster, but I see him as a very sick boy. Sir, you probably created that monster because he's not a boy. He's a grown man. And when are we going to stop infantilizing dangerous grown adult men? Do we ever do that the other way around? Do we ever say, that's not a woman, that's a little girl? No, we don't. Because we don't infantilize women. Well, I mean, we do in some circumstances, but not when they commit a crime, okay? We're not like, oh, but she's just a little baby girl. She didn't know any better. So people go back to beating that same old drum of, oh my God, this is what's going to happen. If men can't get women, they're going to get violent. First, we have to state what's really going on. Men have always been violent. When they could get women, they were violent to the women in their homes. Yep. All we're seeing now is an outgrowth of the violence that would have been reserved for the wife or the girlfriend, the woman inside the home. That's like when we had this, you know, this whole thing, which is still happening, by the way, women getting punched on the street. People find it so shocking, which it is. It absolutely is. But this is nothing new. This has just been going on behind closed doors. This treatment was relegated to the girlfriend, the wife, the concubine. But now, since a lot of women are foregoing relationships, that male aggression is spilling out, like she said. It has nowhere to go. It's no longer behind closed doors. So it's out right in your face. And while it is awful, 
by portraying it as an increase or the fault of women who are withdrawing, you're basically putting the responsibility on women to solve the case of violent yep. men. The whole idea that this man murdered women because he couldn't get a girlfriend. Like, what are you saying about us? That women should be selling their bodies to men yes, in the hopes that saying. it prevents their violence? And what would that woman be going through inside of the home if she did sacrifice for the greater good? He would have... Ah, sorry. It's been violent to her. And, okay, so much of this indoctrination to us girls growing up is, I can change him. He's like, he's like the beast from Beauty and the Beast. If I just give him love and, and homemade cookies and smile and scrub his underwear, then he will turn into a Prince Charming. No! No, uh, oh, stop. <laughs> stop it. I just want to shake some women. And I used to be like that, okay? I used to be like, oh, no. Like, if he's with me, <laughs> he'll totally treat me better. N no. Uh, wrong? Okay. Just the other day, they celebrated the 50th anniversary of women being able to open their own credit cards and accounts. 50 years. Until the 21st century, marital rape was not a crime in all 50 states in the U.S. And until the 90s, DV wasn't really on the book. And even when it was, it was not being enforced and pretty, pretty much still is. The truth is what we're seeing here is exactly what we saw in Plymouth. That man who sat in his mother's basement consuming all of that incel content became violent, literally unlocked his mother, and then went physically out on the street in front of his house and targeted women, including a child, a three-year-old girl. This also happened in America. There was a man in a mall parking lot who said he was waiting and wait for women, and he wanted to unalive women and specifically targeted a baby. A baby. Okay. I just, I'm sorry I keep interrupting. I just, she's making me think of things. So, are we surprised that young girls are wanting to cut off their breasts and become boys? Are we surprised? Okay. Like, when I, when I lived in the hood, I dressed a certain way and carried myself a certain way. So, it was like, don't mess with me. Like, obviously, I know I wasn't really, like, effective at that because I'm, like, five, six and, like, 130 pounds. <laughs> I don't know what I am now. I think I'm like 140, but whatever. Like I was a small little lady walking down the streets of the hood. So I had like my, you know, my, my nose ring, like smoking my cigarette and just trying to look all hard. But I think a lot of young girls are receiving this messaging that it is not, you do not want to be a woman. <laughs> like, and I know I've talked to and heard from a lot of people that transitioned. They were like, I just did not want what comes with being a woman. And I'm like, I totally understand I totally understand, like, because it's not fun. It's not fun. So imagine you're a young girl, and this is what you're observing around you. This is what you have to look forward to. <laughs> Woohoo! So they're like, okay, well, maybe if, like, I'm not a woman, I can be safer. And I'm not saying that's the only reason. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on there. But to me, it makes sense. And, and from some of the people that have transitioned that I've heard from, they're like, yeah, I didn't want to be exploited. I didn't want to be seen as an object. I wanted to be taken seriously. So when I transitioned to, you know, looking and acting like a male, then people finally took me seriously. They didn't sexualize me anymore. So I'm like, I really can empathize with those people. I really can. It's just so sad and heartbreaking. Hey girl. Now, I don't a bit more believe these men were taking their frustration about the lack of women available to them out on little babies and children. I think this is all about control and dominance. You know, it's the same thing you see in wartime. Enemy men want to control women, and so the first thing they do is threaten or attack their children. Well, if you don't do X, Y, and Z, I am going to unalive your child. And of course, women cooperate because they want to protect their children. Also, these men don't see women as people, so they definitely don't see children, particularly girl children, as people. They see them as objects, objects to vent their rage upon, and also objects that will help lure their targets nearer, he knew, by attacking babies. People would obviously defend them, and he'd have more, you know, victims right there for his attack. Because I'm sure when he came in and started attacking people, people were running the other direction, so it's a way to draw people in. What happens next depends on men. The police person who said he was obviously attacking women was herself a woman. While it is clear and obvious to anyone with a brain this is what he was doing, 
The question is when these kinds of attacks are going to be labeled hate crimes. When are they going to have a hate enhancement placed on Terrorism. them? When are we going to see a specific kind of punishment meted out for that? That will be a deterrent to others. I have said for years, attacking a woman because she is a woman in a way that you would only attack women uh, should be a hate crime. Yes. A lot of people are telling women to be more careful, like we haven't been supernaturally, preternaturally careful our entire lives. You were taught from the time you are a little girl, you know, don't go to the second location, scream fire instead of grape. If you think someone's following you, go to the police station or make a bunch of right turns. It's always the same thing. Now, I do think we have to become more offensive. I think women do need to get strapped, you know, get those weapons out and make it do what it does if you think there's any danger. Maybe we should even be practicing group formations for when things like this happen because these men attack solo victims. It wouldn't be much use in the United States where people can get pew-pews easily. But in a place uh, like, you know, Sydney or in Plymouth where people attack with knives, if we had already known to, you know, get in group formation and you know, somebody claw his eyes out and somebody jump on his back and somebody hit him in the head, then maybe more tragedies like this could be prevented or at least limited in scope. So we should definitely talk about that. But overall, I don't think it's up to us to do anything for these attacks, not to prevent them and not to evade them. We need men who call themselves in charge of things to acknowledge the reality that is happening here and do something about it because otherwise women are going to do what we do and continue to withdraw. Men are not going to be able to violence their way into more contact with women, okay? They are not going to be able to scare us into relationships. That season is over. And if other men who call themselves good are not going to do anything about it, they too will be without companionship. So run it. Like yeah. Um, well said. And it was a woman police officer that I believe shot the the assailant. Um, so, you know. But we don't need women in uh, police freaking positions. Like, oh my god. So, yeah. Um, that's, that's it for the show. Uh, I don't know. It's kind of depressing. It's like super depressing. But we can't bury our heads in the sand. Right? So... Be careful out there, you know, have your self-defense tools on you. Um, remember that no is a complete sentence and keep your peace, keep your mental tranquility <laughs> and don't allow these men to siphon off your life force and leave you empty. All right. We'll be back next week. Bye.